It was a week ago, yesterday, the city of Saugus, it's you know, the high school of Saugus, in Santa Clarita, Southern California. A young man took the life of, of two other high school students there on campus and then took his own life. It's just a few days later in Oklahoma at a shopping mall where more people lost their lives. And then here last Sunday in our own city of Fresno, in the Hmong community. Uh, four people lost their lives, taken from them is a better way to put it, and some people were wounded as well. We hear this litany, of, and rightfully so, I, I understand it, we all do, from uh, our, our wonderful uh, law enforcement people, uh, district attorneys, and. Uh, politicians, pastors, priests, bishops like myself. And it's that litany of sadness. And the word that just keeps popping up over and over again is senseless. And it is. You've heard the phrases, senseless crime, senseless shooting. Yeah, it, it is senseless. It, it doesn't make sense. And, and we try to wrap our mind around it, and we can't. We try to uh, somehow reconcile our, our hearts that have been wounded by this, and we can't. I want to read a very short statement from uh, Cardinal DiNardo, the outgoing president of the United, Sta uh, United States uh, Conference of Catholic Bishops, who back uh, this past summer, when there had been yet another horrible shooting in El Paso, uh, wrote the following. Something remains fundamentally evil in our society when locations where people congregate to engage in the everyday activities of life can, without warning, become scenes of violence and contempt for human life. The plague that gun violence has become continues unchecked and spreads across our country. Things must change. Once again, we call for effective legislation that addresses why these unimaginable and repeated occurrences of murderous gun violence continue to take place in our communities. As people of faith, we continue to pray for all the victims and for healing in all these stricken communities, but action is also needed to end these abhorrent acts. He's right. You know, sometimes we're, we're told by people, uh, uh, we're told not to pray. The time for prayer is over and that the time for action is here. Well, it can't be either or. It, it must be both and. and. And we do pray, especially here in Fresno this week, for, for our Hmong brothers and sisters who have suffered so terribly from this, this loss of life, loss of, uh, loss of uh, a loved one. The National Conference of Bishops here in this country has been advocating for uh, sensible gun control within the context of the Second Amendment uh, since at least 1994, and we're still advocating for it, and in a sense still waiting for it. Action is needed, but so often when we think of action, things that need to be done, it's always someone else who needs to do it. It's always some other group or institution that, that needs to get this done. Well. We need to get it done, and it has to start with us. It starts with, with individuals. It starts with families. It starts with small church communities. It, it starts with, with an individual heart deciding to be a, a person of peace, a person of justice. There was a song uh, when English was first introduced into our Catholic liturgy, you know, very early on in the late 1960s when the, the English uh, vernacular music in our liturgy really wasn't very good. <laughs> it's phenomenal now. But I remember a song, and it's still being used, especially among the marriage encounter community, Let There Be Peace on Earth. The, the music, that is, uh, the notes and, and the, the written music, again, not too outstanding. And the words might be considered uh, archaic and corny today, but I love the opening line, and it hits the nail on the head. Let there be peace on earth. Let there be peace on earth, and let it begin with me. 
I've said this before, I'll say it again. Uh, when I'm looking for the person who's most responsible for uh, the biggest problems in my life, I see him every day. It's the guy in the mirror when I'm shaving. That's the guy. So peace needs to begin in my heart and in yours. It's a peace that we're still striving for after so many years. In fact, after 2,000 years. Very recently, we had another reading from the Gospel of Luke in our Catholic tradition this past week. As we wind down the liturgical year, we approach the Feast of Christ the King. And we've had this marvelous journey through the Gospel of Luke. And it's coming to an end, literally. Jesus is heading toward Jerusalem with a purpose. He's not letting really anything get in his way. And it's amazing because he's the one and he's the only one who knows what's waiting for him there. He knows there's a hill there called Golgotha, called Calvary. He knows there's going to be a cross on that hill, literally with his name on it, but also with his title, Christ the King, Jesus of Nazareth king of the Jews. Well, he's king of the world, king of the universe, Christ the king. And as he continues this journey, he arrives on the outskirts of town and it says this, coming within sight of the city, he wept over it and said, if only you had known the path to peace this day, but you have completely lost it from view. Days will come upon you when your enemies will encircle you hem you in and press you hard from every side, they will wipe you out, you and your children, within your walls, and leave not a stone on a stone within you, because you failed to recognize the time of your visitation. Very sobering words, uh, uh, almost frightening words, a prophetic word literally for the city of Jerusalem and Jesus' own day and age, but a cautionary tale for us as well, because we have been preached the word. We have uh, accepted we claim to have accepted the, the Lord Jesus Christ as Prince of Peace into our hearts. I'm reading a book uh, lately about, uh, actually in a biography about the Archbishop John Hughes of New York, the second bishop in, in that city. Bishop in the 1840s through the 1860s, at a time when, uh, among other things, hundreds of thousands of immigrants from Ireland and other places too were uh, coming into our country and especially into New York City. It's ironic that at that time, <clears throat> Archbishop Hughes uh, was really promoting the, the, the beginnings of Catholic education because he felt his Irish children, uh, the, these children of the recent immigrants, were being either neglected or ignored or proselytized in public schools. What upset him? The fact that in public schools they were reading to all of the children passages uh, from uh, the King James Version of the Bible. How I wish that today I were, I were upset because they were reading the King James Version of the Bible in public schools. I wish that were happening. I, uh, any translation, anything we can bring into the, the public forum and, and into our hearts and into our society that speaks of truth and goodness and beauty that speaks of peace and justice that can only come from living a decent life. And in our tradition, we believe a, a gospel life. So, yes, we have our work cut out for us. Yes, we have action to take, but it must begin. It must and can only begin with us. Please join me in prayer in a very special way, as, as I know many of you have been, for our Hmong community again. Uh, they are suffering mightily and they are truly our, our brothers and sisters. God bless them, and God bless you and those you love always and in every way. Mm -hmm.